I know, it's so wonderful. <laughs> and the other thing about crew I wanted to mention, I forgot, I was thinking that you only want two in your boat because when you come in the anchorage, you know, after one of those crossings, it's like coming into the clubhouse after you've lost all your balls, you're down to one ball, you're, you sort of fake the last two two fairways because you've lost the ball, you, you scratch yourself and look at Verm and you know, you're pissed off, you're upset, you're, 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 you're used to it. You walk in the clubhouse with your crew, crew, uh, with your card and say, oh my god, let's go hurry, let's get him, I want to count this up, I don't know, I'm sure I broke it up, this is going to be a really good one. Wrong. He's just faking, right? So when you come into an anchorage, as tired as you are, you put your best coast skip up near the front, right? And, and you smile at everybody and you, 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 you make a little tour of the anchorage and it's just the two of you, right? Two of you, and you got the, when you, when you have a, when you're, when you're beautiful, you, you, you're up there and you can see it and you're smiling, hi, you do a little tour around the anchorage looking for a spot. And with just two people, everybody, you know, everybody's watching, you know, the way it is, right? Everybody's watching and they think, oh, there's just two, it's not a very big boat, they're not sticking rich and arrogant, they're just a little boat and they're going, oh, this is cute, there's only two of them, we should have them over, right? We should have them over, they're nice, they're nice. But if you come in there with four guys, but four of burly guys, three up on the foredeck, arguing or fiddling around on the anchor, not looking at anybody, and the other guy, yelling at him from the stern. Nobody wants to have you necessarily. <laughs> you don't want that. You want to be attractive. Life is a performance. You come into the anchorage and you to you. Hey, we're available. You know, like, no problem. My God, that was fun. Did you guys enjoy that? How long have you been here? Love your boat and you're, you're, you're busy. And if you, and if you have two or three, you've got your whole culture. Nobody wants to have five people over on their boat right off the bat. No, you want two. The whole idea is you leave your friends at home, and you, and you go out there and you explore new places and you meet new people and there's a, there's a fluidity that goes on in every anchorage that's filled with all kinds of boats from all different parts of the world and you only want two because you know, then you, you, know, you can go out and you can come back and, and when you're provisioning your boat, those of us who have real boats and don't have best around with that freezer crap stuff, you have a little bit of single malt because uh, everybody has rum, like hello, right? You can't offer cold beer when you don't have any cold, period, but a little bit of that goes a long way. So we always put that on your provisioning list. I didn't mention that the other day. But I used a little bit of rum a little bit of whiskey. long way as well. Yeah, rum, but everybody has rum, but you're special with a little bit of single malt. Just a, t just a small point. <coughs> okay, enough of the crew. <laughs> We're going to talk about the boat. Favorite line, youth has said youth, and I believe it is wasted on the young. Thank goodness his boats are not. That is beautiful. Is she not absolutely beautiful? Let's just look at this for a minute. Number one, she's not too big and, and heavy or anything. You know what I mean? She's not big and squat. She's just the right size. Her proportions are beautiful. The lines, the curves. Look at that sweet shear. You know, from the bow down, there's a little sweet little shear. Just, just a grace. There's absolute... Beauty in that, you know. If, if you if you love curves, that's a sweet shirt. The proportion of the freeboard to the uh, to the length is is spot on. It's just right. It's got a very proud. It's called a spoon. It's a proud sort of pesky bow, and, and there's enough with the, uh, the, the, the with the uh, flare. It's a, a Y-shaped flare. It should, when, I, I, when we were charging through those waves, it comes right up to the gun, but never goes over. It never seems to go over. I just think, uh, the, the magic inside naval architecture goes so far beyond that any of us, we mortals, could, could, could get. Right? This is a very proud bow, and the stern's got this tight little back end, you know, this tight little back end, but not too tight. She doesn't bury. She's got enough flotation that she rises up, and it's got it right. Sailboat design is like evolution. From a medical point of view, it's, it's all about evolution. And most evolution moves forward with mutations, with small changes, and most mutations are are still bursts, uh, or, or uh, not still bursts, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're a late period, period, right? They don't go very far. So you don't want, as the richest guy in the world, does not want to have his own boat built especially for him, because you know what, that's a new mutation, it's probably going to be a dog. You want to have a <laughs> boat that has, has success. And so this boat, the mold was made in 75, they're still making them, it's made in America. You know, no offense to offshore North America, but even the days before NAFTA, it's still, you kind of have an idea where it's coming from. You're going to hide so much sin under gel coat, so you want to know what yard it came from, because you know, who knows what's kind of junk in there. So anyhow, we got the bow, and then, and then and the tight little rear end, and a cutaway forefoot, and the, and the brewer bite, and the deadwood's cutaway, so the wetted surface area is reduced, but it still has, it still has a really fantastic tracking, and the, the length of the keel, you can't see it. And the width is going over the N N O A A is a shape there that, that and when the boat doesn't go like this, the boat kind of goes like this, right? So there's a there, and it prevents leeway, so it, it does and it has a nice windward performance and it, it, it works. It absolutely works. And freeboard's only 30 inches. 
So it's really easy up on uh, uh, out of out of, out of the game. It's I know you guys are love your boat, but you know what? I love our boat. <laughs> really, you know, you get rid of all the other stuff and you see the beauty of the whole thing, right? You gotta focus in on it. And it has nothing to do with square footage. You know, they're selling catamarans by the square foot, right? Like that ain't what it's all about, right? See this we you know, we lose a lot of volume in the in the rear end because she's got canoe stern, but you know, who, who cares? It's a sailboat, right? It's a sailboat. And it's uh and, and and when we're out there as concrete operational thinkers, we're going to be looking at the sales all the time. We think that sales is all what's happening. We're wrong. The sales is only half the equation. The sales is in the wind, and they're driving the boat forward. But the boat is in the water, and it's hanging it back, right? It's the two working in concert, which is so beautiful. Doesn't that look like a humpback whale in heat? We have one in it's, just, it's just so beautiful. You gotta, remember when you're sitting there in the boat, and it's moving, like, it's, it's sexy down below, right? Her bottom is... It's really good. It's, it's really good. Protective, solid, scape, folding, prop, ideal, fantastic. Uh, oh yeah, one of the reasons why offshore boat talks are so boring is that we can never take a picture of ourselves because we're always in the picture. You need to be a super mega rich and you got to go two, three hundred yards away to go back and look at it. So this is not uh, Turwin, this is a sister ship. A couple of, couple of guys who are uh, wide on the boats the city on here. There's the shoreline. It's a coastal boat. Uh, surprise! Coastal boat going to windward. But it is a cutter. Uh, and uh, that just to sort of forgive We don't have a picture of Turwin anyway because uh, we're all by ourselves all the time. There's no one to take our picture. Right? If we ever had somebody come to take our picture, we guys are ready to picture. Well, we don't have any pictures because we're all there by ourselves. Okay. That's the boat. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What the boat doesn't have. Oh, yeah, a boat is 16,000 pounds. 16,000 pounds equates into the maximum sails about 300 square feet. That's a bag about yay big. And even a weakling, an old, male, fat, balding, bearded guy like me could drag that bag around. But you get much bigger than 16,000 pounds of spigs. The only part that's real work on this boat is dragging sails around. And, and so you want to have a smaller boat so that you can drag the sails around. It's the only part that... And, and there's no mechanical... We, uh, I've even did a pinch and pull the anchor up, you know, when you're, where you're scared, you can do it. You, I mean, the boat's small enough, you don't need mechanical devices. You're trying to make it safe, trying to make it fun. And, uh, uh, and it, what it doesn't have is uh, refrigeration. It doesn't have, uh, nor air conditioning, of course. It certainly doesn't have a water maker because they break and there's a noose. You still got to carry all that water anyway. And uh, what other gadgets do they have nowadays? Oh, yeah, electric autopilots. Or showers. Or showers. <laughs> yeah. Or cold beer. Yeah, cold beer, exactly. We, we would look for go to shore. So now, thank you, Ted. Now we're going to go to the There's going to be a little bit of a pause here. And uh, I want to, now, and, 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 and before we talk about the sales, I want to talk about how they came to be. Why is there a problem moving from a coastal sailing community to an offshore uh, sailing boat. What, what is the problem? What is the difference? And how did that come to be? What are the trade winds? Who was the first guy? And why did they find the trade winds? And where, and where did it happen? So you got to start somewhere. And this, for me, this is the most fascinating thing that's going on. I spent the whole summer, you know, chasing this thing and, and uh, interrogating Vitos and Hassig and, and struggling with this thing. And, uh, and, uh, but you got to start somewhere. Now, here's a handsome dude. Here he is. You got to start somewhere. So we're we're all sort of basically waspy types. We come from you know, the, you know I forgot it. What's the I won't say it. Anyway, so we come from the Western Europe, right? And we can't go. Don't go there, Bill. Don't go there. But essentially, we came from this heritage. You know, the age of discovery was the, was was embedded in the a, in golden age of sail, and we are the vestigial remnant of that time. Prior to 150 years ago, there was nothing but sailboats. Period. We are it. It is last. And it all changed with that disruptive technology called steel and steam happened in the end of the 1800s. Rather like celestial navigation got put to bed by GPS, well, the wooden sailboats got put to bed by steam and, and, and steel. And it's a sad thing. But we, that's why we have this deep, deep history. But where did that all start? Where did the trade winds come from? Who figured that out? Who went out there first? Where did that happen? Well, it happened right here. We'll talk about Henry the Navigator. In the mid-early 1400s. Bear with me. There's six slides. I've got to get this up. This is so cool. This is really so cool. <laughs> Henry the Navigator, Portuguese, about the fifth or sixth son down the road. Uh, he wasn't getting anything. He was, a, he, And they were fighting. And they, they just got rid of the Moors. They got rid of those Arabs for 800 years. They were occupying the Iberian Peninsula. But the good news is, not only did they bring uh, the Greek heritage back to our Western world, they also brought a major wheel, like, discovered the wheel, but it's, it's a four and a half sail plan called the Latin sail. So Henry the Navigator, he, they, got rid of, uh, they got rid of the Arabs, 
and uh, the Moors, as they called them in those days. And, uh, and the Moors, somewhere the Moors, before Mohammed even showed up, the, in the Red Sea and in the Northern Indian Ocean, these guys figured out a, the first fore and aft sail plan, the Latin sail. This is huge. This is totally incredible. This is why our, the cutter, the sloop, the catch, the yawl, the, uh, the cat, they're all, they're all fore and aft, right? These guys developed it. Why did they develop it? Because they had to go to windward. They actually managed to go to windward. The Vikings, bless their hearts, they rode to windward, as did the Phoenicians and the Romans and the Greeks. The idiots, they had long skinny ships with hands of or ro guys rowing like crazy to go to windward. They went downwind with a square sail. That's no brainer. But to go to windward, the Arabs figured it out first. Well, the Polynesians did too. We don't go there right now. And then, <laughs> but for us, it was this guy who figured out, oh, you know what? And then, in the, in the mid-1400s, they got rid of the Arabs, but uh, uh, Constantinople fell in 1453, and the Spice Road got chopped. By this time, Europe has coming out of that yoke of, of Catholic Dark Ages, and they were addicted to spice. They really wanted the spice. So they, they wanted to go get this stuff, and they didn't dare go across the Sahara Desert because it's filled with Arabs, and the Spice Road filled. So this Henry the Navigator, he, he, he was the patron saint of sailing. He, he took the Latine sail, he put it on a round ship, i.e. One third wide, two thirds long, has enough carrying capacity to end, and he. He made one called a caravel. So it's, a, a, it's, a, it's called a round ship. It's, it's one third wide, two thirds long. There's not a single one that survived antiquity. It's just a few pictures on bosses. But they figured it was a latine sail that went and, and, and a round bottom. So that every night they went, into, they went on the beach and they worked their way around Africa until uh, Bartholomew in 1488 made it all the way around Africa. All the way around Africa. But they, when they did in the process of doing so, the, the caravel evolved. See, all Latin sails. The caravel evolved into the Karak. Now, the Karak, once again, it's a, it's a one third, two thirds, uh, one third, uh, two, uh, three long. And you look what happened. They kept, they kept the Latin sail and they, they put square sails up front. Perfect. Perfect because they're offshore now for the first time. Oh, thank you, love. Yeah, it feels so much better. There it is. So they got, all the, so they got these square sails up front. Well, the center of effort is driving the boat forward. They're running downwind in, 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 in the, uh, uh, in the, out in the open ocean for the first time. They left the Mediterranean Sea where it's always to windward, dinking around where you needed to go to windward. Now they're going around after they're going in the South Atlantic and they discovered, you know, the Latin sail is not so good downwind, right? So they, they, they squared it off and ran it downwind. And, um, wrong button. Complicated. <laughs> 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 this is a modern one. Anything more complicated, things start to go wrong. You want it simple. Simple, right? If you have that type, you make it simple, you make those mistakes. Well, those are the more complicated brains do them. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> good thing. It's a good thing because you're going to need it. Anyway, so here we are. This is a replica of a Karak. And uh, when uh, Christopher Columbus set off, he had two caravels and one Karak. Santa Marie was a Karak. And, uh, and uh, the cool thing was the, 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 the thwart ship sail plan was rediscovered uh, to go offshore downwind. And, uh, uh, and then that evolved, and the sh ships got bigger, and then they went to a full rig ship where they had square sail even on the aft rig. So the definition of a square rig ship is that there's, there's a fore and aft, uh, a thwart ship sail plan. So there's the two sail plans. Fore and aft what we got, and a thwart ship for the guys who first discovered the, the trade Now Christopher Columbus's brilliance was the Volta du Mar. He figured it out, that, and he figured it out that the, uh, oh, I got a pointer, I got a pointer. They, you know, this, <laughs> these all the one way up, but this, but this, Bless their little hearts, they, they missed the whole deal here. <laughs> you got a lot of people in the They got that, that one, two, three, four going out. But how did he get home? He doesn't go home this way. They went this way. Hello! He did it. He, the, that was the, the, the turn of the Volta du Mar. The, 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 the Atlantic High sitting right in there, right, right, right and the wind's blowing around. The, the train was blowing around. And, and, and Columbus figured it out that to get back home, he go north, he'd ride home. Perfect. Perfect. The trade winds are now discovered.